Great. So we are on. Um, I'm Jack Kafton, and uh, I'll be hosting today's webcast, we're calling it, uh, with Margot Chase. Um, this is our very first webinar, I should say. So um, it's a little bit guerrilla style. Um, so we're going to do it and, and ask for forgiveness later. <laughs> but, um, and also, I'm at work, so, you know, Someone may come in and just say you're fired or something. So if that happens, we'll all know why. <laughs> but um, at any rate, um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, we recently had an event on design and failure last week, and uh, we wanted to extend that conversation today with Margo. So Margo, I, I was going to say a little bit about you, and I'm sure people are familiar with you, but um, uh, we know that you you studied biology, um, veterinary medicine um, as an undergraduate, um, mm -hmm. and then you took an illustration class, from what I understand, and is where a medical illustration class, if I'm correct, in which you began to yeah. enjoy the beauty of graphic design. Um, you have, and we can <laughs> well, talk about it's this. It's not quite. Believe me. It's yeah. not quite right. Oh no. Yeah, it's. But yeah, I was a biology major, and I, I had like wanted to be a veterinarian ever since I was a little kid. And so I, I went to um, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo and enrolled in their um, you know, biology program. And I was taking electives and trying to, you know, because in order to get into graduate school in veterinary medicine, you have to have like a 3.8 GPA or better. So I was really paranoid about taking elective classes that I knew I could get a really good grade in. So I, and I could always draw. So I was art classes where you know, drawing the human form, whatever, still like that kind of stuff. And I accidentally ended up in a graphic design class um, because they had just started the graphic design, applied art design program there. And um, I had, it was before computer registration, and so I, I ended up in this, this class. I had no idea what graphic design even was. But it was the most fun I ever had, and I got a great grade. <laughs> so it was like, it was, it was kind of an awesome experience. And plus, uh, um, as I continued through the graphic design program, I ended up getting a minor degree in design, and it was way more fun than biology. I, and I love science, don't get me wrong, it was amazing, but the classes are a lot more rigorous and, and people don't dye their hair word colors as a general rule, so by, design was a lot more fun. And I kept trying to figure out in graduate school, can I stick things I love, like science and design, together? And I thought medical illustration would do that, and I went to... Um, graduate school at UC San Francisco in medical illustration and it was huge disappointment because it really wasn't the problem sol the problem solving part and the searching part of the design that I really liked. It was a lot of science and that part was great. A lot of sort of rigorous um, drawing and illustration of things like anatomical field studies and um, surgical procedures and it you know if you make something a different color or move it to a different spot because you know, you know, it balances you a little better, it's a different disease. <laughs> so, so they really don't encourage creativity. So the analogy one of the instructors said is like, you really don't want a really creative airline pilot. You want a competent airline pilot. <laughs> so it just seemed like the wrong thing for me. So uh, I ended up dropping out. I, didn't ever, I did not finish the program. And I ended up trying to get a job as a designer in San Francisco with the portfolio that had anatomical field studies and a beautifully labeled illustration of the human foot in carbon dust, which is a really antique kind of a style of illustration. Um, I think I interviewed with all of the Michaels and I, um, I didn't get hired by any of them. <laughs> I had a couple of really interesting interviews where the person looking at my portfolio clearly really puzzled about why I was trying to get a job in graphic design since I had very little design in my portfolio. Um, so eventually I yeah, you... moved to, San, to Los Angeles and was sleeping on friends so stuff and um, I got a, a job as a production person kind of minion assistant at an advertising agency in Long Beach and um, they did all of the packaging, the um, generic packaging for Ralph's grocery stores which back, this is like mid 80s, back then it was all, generic packaging was like a white label with a blue stripe and like black stymie bold and it said beer or facial tissue or whatever the packaging was. So it, it was again not a particularly creative <laughs> thing to get. 
with to do that. The generic um, Right, no, generic the, white the, care with a blue stripe. Beer that just had beer on it. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Design package for that was, yeah, it was a big challenge. So, um, but I got a good, a bunch of good breaks actually along the way. And the first one was I did um, an interview for some freelance work at a little tiny publishing company. Um, and the creative director there, his name is Rick Fry. And um, working for, on his staff as a designer um, was a woman named Laura LaPuma. And Laura LaPuma ended up going to Warner Brothers Records. And Rick is now the um, VP creative director at the CW Network. And so the two of them have been really instrumental in getting me work a lot of other places through the years. So Laura moved to from this little publishing company to Warner Brothers Records. And she was the reason I got to work on Prince and Madonna and a lot of other album cover projects sort of early on because she knew me from that little tiny publishing company. So that was a really awesome break. And then I'm still you know, doing a lot of work with Rick and have been for what it's been thirty years, thirty years of design. That's great. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, if we rewind a little bit back to when you were walking around San Francisco with your anatomical drawings and and you couldn't get a job, how how did that did that feel like failure at the time? What was your your kind of reaction to that, and how did you process that? At the yeah, time? It, yeah, it did. I mean, I I that it was a really scary moment because my parents had told me not to drop out of back, you know medical school and to keep going and be a vet because it was a very stable you know thing to do and what is this graphic design stuff anyway and like how will you ever make a living and then here I was in San Francisco with you know paying my rent by student loan and having dropped out of school and, and I couldn't get a job and so it was kind of embarrassing and scary and yeah I mean I thought maybe I had just completely you know made the wrong choices um, so, and there were days I when I, know. after I moved to LA, when I was freelancing, where I just was not making enough money. And there were days where I had to decide if I, you know, I had enough money to put gas in the car or I could buy lunch, but not both. <laughs> and that was pretty, that was scary. But it was a great, you know, it was a good learning experience too. And I'm just either arrogant or dumb enough to think that eventually if I stuck with it, I would, you know, something good would happen. And um, it did eventually. It took a while. That's great. Um, I want to bring up a uh, presentation that you shared with me, and you have some examples that you wanted to walk through specifically. Um, so let me uh, see if I can share my screen here. Can you guys see my screen yet, or I can't? But I don't know if that means that. Can you? Oh yeah, they can. Oh, can. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> well, there we have today's title slide. Sorry. Yep, I got. I can see you now, John. Okay, great. Um, so let's let's move on. So I I imagine this is a, a picture of your current studio. Yeah. So we, um, as I said, we. Uh, my, my office was founded in 1986, so this is our official, last year actually was our official 30-year anniversary. <laughs> and um, we have offices in Los Angeles, which is obviously where I start. And then um, we have an office in New York as well, which is the upper left-hand picture. So um, we're about 40 people um, when you add up both, both staff on both coasts. And started from you know, I, you know me alone to 40 people, but it's taken about a person a year if you think about it. So it's not really fast growth. Although lately it's been a pretty crazy. I bet. Um, so you know it's quite a thing, and uh, and some of the materials I've I've learned about you, you you actually didn't really set out to start your own business and to be an entrepreneur. Um, so so what were some <laughs> of the learnings on that path? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, one of the one of the biggest um, questions I have a question later on in this deck that says, you know, what was the scariest lesson you learned from failure? And I, I think one of the the early on in, in um, you know in my development as a designer, you know, I was gradually hiring people, kind of slowly. So the first I'd hire an assistant, I hired somebody to help me do my 
books. Um, and then finally I found Chris Lowry, who's my partner now. And so about, we've been together almost 20 years. And um, when he first started working with me, um, we decided to hire a, a business consultant because we thought, okay, we've got to figure out how to do this for real and try to grow the company. And so we hired a business consultant to come in and he took a look at our books and our financials and how much we were charging and he just kind of shook his head and he said, you know, you guys should consider getting jobs because I don't think you're doing too well at this. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so that was so that another was a, one of those. That was a roadblock. Yeah, that was a little bit of a roadblock, and I I knew I didn't have the ability or the knowledge to manage the company very well, and Chris was learning as well. So this the guy that we hired was really helpful. I mean, he kind of trained us to um, help manage our time. You know, do appropriate contracts, like all the kind of you would think that you would. Have known I would have gotten that a little sooner, but but no, um, and a lot of that stuff isn't necessary when you're as or as necessary when you're a single person designer because you're just supporting yourself and your own overhead. But and I was working out of my house kind of early on, but um, when, as you start to grow, it becomes really easy to start you know having to pay people and photographers and all these things, and you can spend more money than you're making really easily without paying attention, which is kind of what we were doing. So. <laughs> So it was, it was really kind of a, yeah, it was a splash of cold water and it was a really good lesson and we, um, you know, we got a lot better at it. So we, we I, you know, I really, I learned that whole time is money thing really, mm. you know, and that's still, honestly, to, to be honest, that's still the biggest challenge we have is good design takes time and time is expensive and a lot of the time clients don't have the budget that you wish they would have to let you do the work you really, really want to do. So often I'm doing things on nights and weekends. I'm still, and I mean, the staff here stays late. I mean, we spend, we spend a lot of time on the work we do to try to make it as, as good as it can possibly be given the constraints of the clients, you know, and the, and the project. Um, so that was one of the big learning things. And then the other big thing I think I learned from that was to really hire smart people to help me whenever I could. So a good business manager, uh, someone to do my books who was trustworthy and smart was critical and, and getting good help, you know, good talent. And when we were first starting, we were so small and we had so little money that I couldn't afford to hire someone with a lot of experience. So I had people right out of school, designers out of school, out of Art Center, out of Cal State Long Beach, out of wherever, and had to just try to you know, hopefully get somebody where that looked like they had a lot of talent and could grow and were willing to kind of get dirty and be, you know, you know, work, work hard and um, grow with us. And, and so I've been really fortunate through the years of getting a lot of smart, talented, you know, young people out of school. And some of them have stayed with me for years and them, you know, were there for a couple of years and then went on to other, other jobs and other design firms. And so it's, you know, it's good. I have a lot of you know, there are ex-Chase people around L.A. <laughs> so. It's good to have a nice footprint that way. And you're certainly not the first person I've talked to that, that has deployed that strategy um, well, so that's great. Um, but uh, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about definitions of failure. I mean, it sounds like, you know, everyone has their own perspective on it. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of literature out there today of that sort of cost, uh, cast failure in a positive light. Um, if you're not failing almost, you know, you must be doing something wrong. So I'm wondering, and I love this quote you have from Winston Churchill, which yeah. sort of reminds me of the Woody Allen quote of like just 90% is just showing up of success. Um, but yeah. tell me a little bit I, about your perspective and what this means. Yeah, well, it was interesting because I had to sort of think about this a while when you invited me to, to do this. So, um, I mean, the thing that, that really came up for me is that being in a creative business we are, we are actually pretty comfortable with failure, I think, because the process incorporates it, right? I mean, the idea of experimentation and trial and iteration, you're always in that process and that with, like, trying it and does this work? Can I make this work? Good. What can we do instead? I mean, so... To me, the comfort level you get to with 
kind, certain kinds of failure, that sort of creative exploration kind of failure. But there are some other kinds of failure that are sort of that I would qualify as like guilt failure, like um, losing a pit, and, and we've done that. And that can be really expensive and like humiliating. And you know, we do that now. Now that we're a larger company, we pitch against a lot of um, big agencies for the accounts. And sometimes we win, sometimes we don't. And it's expensive to pitch because we spend a lot of time traveling there. It's not just me; it's the team. We put together, you know, our our uh, capabilities material. Sometimes there's work in advance of the RFP um, where they want you to demonstrate your abilities, and so. Usually that's paid, but it's not paid very well. <laughs> so it's right. you know there's a lot of an investment of time and energy and effort that goes into these things. And when we don't win, uh, it's really a, yeah I hate losing. Say I mean that's part of my nature I think, and maybe one of the reasons I'm here is I'm a very competitive person. <laughs> and mm -hmm. So you you know like well, all you have to do to get me to awesome. just tell me I can't and <laughs> so it, I hate it's losing. I hate hate it. hate it. Um, but what we try to well, do is, or I always try to figure out, better. yeah, so those I'm are sorry. big failures, and then we do uh, times from accounts for, sometimes for reasons that are beyond our control, but sometimes for reasons that I should have seen coming and just was to, in, you know, in possibly my competitive nature and my, like, desire to win, we had a, um, um, an example of a small business that needed a rebrand a couple of, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and um, it, the budget was super small, and it was one of those projects where meeting the guy, he was kind of weird, and I was just like, I just, I, I don't have a really good feeling about it, but it's a really great product, and I know we can fix the packaging. The packaging he had was, very, was really bad, and, and the process didn't, like we presented, the first round we presented something like 17 designs, he basically said, well, it looks like you guys have no opinion. <laughs> so then when we wow. narrowed it down the next round, where are the other options? You guys aren't showing us, us, us enough breath. It was one of those where like, I, was, I should have realized we're not winning this. We're not going to, this is not going to go well. But instead of just, you know, we ran through the, the parameters of our, our original proposal. And instead of just saying thanks and no thanks, he came back, would you be willing to do one more try? But we can't pay for it. And of course, like an idiot, I said yes. Um, and of course, it did. It was just throwing good time after bad, and it was. It did not go. It, he didn't like it. He ended up going somewhere else for design, which I think still stinks. But that's probably so great. <laughs> but so you know, those things happen, right? And it's my. Sometimes it's just me getting caught up in the fact that we have to win this. We can do this. Like I'm going to force it down their throats that we know what we're doing. And you know, uh, you would think after 30 years of this that I'm better, but I don't. I'm still learning lessons. <laughs> well, it's certainly, you know, we all, all of us in the client services business have felt the pain of the acquisition costs and giving away free work. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah. I wonder, so there's, there's certainly that, but is there a kind of intellectual or, you know, uh, knowledge um, and learning that you get from those uh, failures, quote unquote, um, other than the, the pain of losing? Um, how do you how do you sort of uh, disseminate well, with your team when? Yeah. Well, I, I usually and it's especially with this the team. I mean, I'm really clear with them that it's not their fault. The work was beautiful. I mean, in my opinion, and I didn't. It wasn't my personal work. It's the creative team here, so it's easier for me to be objective and say really gorgeous solutions. He did not choose them. You did not do anything. The fact that we aren't able to continue with this is not your fault. So the, that kind of stuff is it, my, I feel like it's my responsibility to be able to tell from an intuitive, you know, sort of people's standpoint if a project is a good fit for us. And I'm, I think I'm getting better at that. And every once in a while I get kind of caught up in, the, you know, creative process too much and I stop paying attention to the rest of the conversation. And um, that's something again I'm, I'm trying to learn because I you know coming from being a creative rather than a manager a lot of my framework for what is makes a good project is about the creative opportunity and whether we will and so when I see an opportunity that where I'm like oh my god it's a great product it's in a really good category this could be awesome 
I, you know, I forget, you know, it's sort of, I put the blinders on sometimes for the things that I should be paying attention to, the warning signs. Mm. So, so when, when Bruce Mao has said, um, you know, love our experiments as we would an ugly child and take the long view and allow ourselves the fun of failure every day, this is something that you would agree with? Yes, I would. And I think, I mean, to me, just to get back to like how I define failure, I mean, to me, the big, biggest failure is to not do good work. Like to have stuff out in the world is a failure, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And we try not to do that whenever we possibly can. And there have been occasions when we just, the client insisted on change the point where what, I, what results is not what I wish. It so, you know, it doesn't end up in our portfolio and it doesn't end up on the shelves in my office. <laughs> so, so, and that I consider that a failure because I think part of just, especially these days, my job is not to be or as much as it's to be a strategic, you know, of good design and like a problem solver for the client. So where mm -hmm. I feel like my role is, is explaining why a particular thing is a good solution for them, why this is a better option, um, why it's going to connect better to their consumer. Um, sometimes I, I, you know, I talk and talk and talk and I, I lose. And I, you know, it doesn't make me stop trying though. That's why I like that Winston church. <laughs> I just keep going <laughs> like, okay, so we, we didn't do it. Give us another opportunity. We can do it better. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's move on in your, uh, whoops. We talked a little bit about this. Maybe I'll, I'll move on in the interest of time. Um, what are we looking at here? Oh, yeah, super early lessons because when I first so office staff as it existed in about 1988, I think, um, and um, maybe a little bit because Chris is there later than that, probably early 90s. Um, beautiful Gothic work, which comes Oops. from fantasy and all kinds of stuff. So we had probably done every and started to get a reputation for the oh yeah woman she really likes that gothic stuff. So if you have anything gothic or anything <laughs> to do with that, you know, give them a call because they're the they're the design firm for that. So Empire Slayer, we did Bram Stoker's Dracula, we did all these things. And um, I started to realize that we were getting, you know, labeled and Someone had told me when it was really important for a designer to have a style, and so I th thought maybe they'd go great. So at least I'm getting known for something. That's good and visible, and I'm getting to do all this kind of cool work. Um, but as time went on, we started getting more and more, you know, gone. you can keep going on those pages, Dot, if you want to, because there's a lot more of them. Oh, I yeah. mean, I think we did every sure. slightly oriented vampire, witch, you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anything that had to do with that, we, we did for a while. And um, the challenge, the problem was that's what our portfolio looked like. And I, I thought that consumer, that clients would have a much broader sense of ability, like this lettering and go, oh yeah, those guys can do amazing logos. So if we give them a look, something, you know, like a tech company, they'll still be able to do that. They'll be able to do a package mm -hmm. or something that isn't a music package. But the clients are a lot of the time really little. Girl, and so that's a huge, you know, mistake and kind of a, a failure of me kind of understanding how business works and how the world works. And it was an, an immense amount of work for us to change the direction of the ship. I mean, we'd been doing this kind of work for about a decade, and mm -hmm. I realized that I really wanted to have more breadth and I wanted to do other kinds of work and I really wanted to get involved in packaging. Um, and we pitched and we showed. The portfolio, and we went to meetings over and over, and got nowhere because people would look at the portfolio and just go, "Well, you know, we're going to end up with a Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, whatever it is." Then we don't want. That. Right. So, 
the first couple of projects that weren't in the Gothic style that were sort of toward my goal of packaging, we did for really, really low fees. I mean, we pretty much just begged and promised and said, if you don't like it, you know, it's like, we'll, you know, the fees are really low. It's, you can go by a phase, and if you don't like it in the beginning, we won't be charge you for the rest of the project. Just stop. So it was, that was, that was a big, strong lesson I learned early on that, like, the, you really need to diversify and that the value that we have as designers is much more about our brains and our breadth of being able to solve things than it is about getting known for a particular style. Like getting known for a style can get you visibility, but it's also, you know, this trap that then that's yeah. all the, kind, the only kind of stuff that people associate with you. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a valuable lesson. Um, well, speaking of valuable lessons, um, what, what would you say to this, this question? Well, the most, this was the slide that went with the story about the, the um, business consultant <laughs> because um, that, that, that whole idea was really the most valuable lesson. But, you know, I mean, I thing there, too, is I could have quit at that point and gotten a job. I mean, I'd been doing design long mm -hmm. enough at that point that I had you know, that was, I could have gone back to, like, what I thought I was going to do in the beginning, which was work for somebody else. But by then, I was kind of stubborn and competitive and whatever. And I was like, I can, af I can figure this happen. And it was never about money because I thought I could probably make more money getting a job. I knew that I was making men getting a job. Um, but I really thought I really wanted to be in control of the kinds of work I did and the kinds of clients I worked for. And I wanted the freedom to be able to hire people I wanted to work with, you know, and have people around me that I like. So all of those things were really part of, you know, I realized that those are the things that you get when you have your own company. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of risk and scariness about it, but um, it was really worth, it was worth continuing to stumble forward. <laughs> and I love this um, quote too keep going and you'll stumble on something and I mean that's kind of the in a nutshell the process because I would love to say that when I first started I saw where I am now and that's what I wanted to happen but that's not really mm -hmm. the trajectory it's been much more random and like you know we tried a lot of different things it didn't work out like at one point I we thought oh doing licensed um, style guides would be a really great business and we had done a few of them and they were really fun because you get to do apparel patterns and you get to kind of visual what a brand might be when it's a t-shirt or you know a household you know decor item or something but it's crazy business and you know we had to do it a while to figure out well it's not really what it's not the brains side of things it's not the problem-solving side of things that I really love it's the making pretty things spin part <laughs> which is satisfying but it didn't engage our sort of love brain so you know there have been a lot of things we tried that didn't end up being what I thought they would be. You know, I'm wondering if there are, um, I mean, many of us in the, in the organization work in different design capacities, um, and would you say there are unique manifestations of failure as relates to identity and branding work that other designers working in other disciplines might not be exposed to? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, I think there's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, what, so, some examples actually occur to me, I think, because, we, you know, we've done a lot of logos. And, I mean, one of the things that happens sometimes has happened more often in the past, fortunately, than, than recently. But in, in doing letter forms and doing something unusual with letter forms, sometimes you create um, something that you didn't know you were creating. Like, we did a logo for uh, a band that had a snake uh, in it with, you know, going up. And um, it became the phallic symbol logo, which I had not, I did not notice that that's what it looked like. But as soon as somebody, <laughs> as soon as it got published, it got all kinds of press about the phallic symbol logo for the band. And I was like, oh. Serendipity. I had no, no, yeah, I had no idea that's what we were doing. Um, so, yeah, I, that's those kinds of things that you inadvertently, sort of the semiotics that you invert, inadvertently create without knowing it um, can be a really, <laughs> Big failure in logo design. Right, right. Um, the slide you have up right now is actually in reference to something that 
didn't necessarily happen to me, but was something that I saw happen to a lot of my um, colleagues as, as you know the computer started. So when I got when I started in 1986, we were doing everything by hand, um, and I didn't get my first Mac, the Mac 2 CI that you see there, until 1991. So we were a little bit late to the party. Um, at, but a lot of designers in Emigre magazine were playing around with the early Macs and you know bitmaps um, programs, and you know trying to figure out what you could do with this new technology um, as a designer. And to be honest, I kind of looked at what was happening, and I, I was pretty dismissive of it early on. I was like, "Oh, this looks. This is not what I'm doing." Because this big, you know, swashy, gorgeous, hand done lettering, and it was you know all about the beauty of the curve and all that stuff and I'm like it's not bitmap at all <laughs> so I really didn't I it was having a really hard time visualizing how this thing was going to help me and a lot of other people had the same experience um, and had the same sort of feelings about it but um, I was doing enough work in the music business when Photoshop first started that I realized wow there that application is actually pretty cool and there might be some things I can mm -hmm. do with that so we did you know, take the jump and make buy our first computer. So my first Mac was a Mac 2 CI, and I think it was twenty thousand dollars. And it was like wow. instead of floppy disk, I mean, the slowest, smallest, most cheap. I mean, it was so easy. And it, I mean, there was there was only one undo. There were no layers. I mean, there was. I mean, it was unbelievably prehistoric <laughs> and wow. hard. But you know, it was. If I hadn't made the jump to learn. Learning to you and incorporating it into, you know, my process. Then I think I would have been like what I saw happen to a lot of people, which is they just never made the leap, and they had to rely on younger designers who knew how to use the technology in order to um, art direct the design. And that kind of change is still ha happening. And every time we make a leap in technology in our industry, it leaves some people behind. And I mean, you could consider that sort of, um, you know, becoming a let right, or you know, becoming the sort of um, Neanderthal design person as, as failure and I think it is you know because I think part of if there's anything that's really really consistent that I've seen over the years it's how fast change and how quickly the way you do things changes so it's clearly it's clear to me that what are paying for what's valuable about design is not the how you make it it's not even the what you make it's how you think about it so that, that mm -hmm. What you're getting, and you know the value there, really in your in your brains, and your sort of visual understanding of what design can do, not how it's made. Yeah, you know, we might we might be living in a world one day where artificial intelligence is is the actual designer, and and we're all creative directors telling it what to do. <laughs> but yeah, um, well, and I'm, you look yeah, at the rate of specializing in now is packaging, uh, and um, we oh sorry. We, I mean, we we specialize in packaging now, and I think that's another area that's really changing. And and if you look at the future of how people shop, like a lot of people won't even going into stores. They're going to be buying things online. I mean, so how what packaging means and how it functions, all of that's going to change. Yeah. And so it's kind of up to us to figure out how does what's the role of you know a package designer then if we're not really making if we're not putting something in a box on a shelf. Like then is it that second one? moment of truth. it's the box you open up when you get you order the product like does do things even need packages and then it becomes something more industrial design and the object itself I mean there's just all of mm. these kind of you know places I can see things going that if you know, if we don't pay attention we're just gonna be left in the dust the way a lot of other people have in the past and I don't want to be that person mm. really. <laughs> how, or that I'm country. curious how do you sure how do you how do you foster and cultivate um, that that knowledge, that, that rate of change? With that, I mean, we're all kind of knowledge workers now as designers. How do you how do you instill that in your studio, um, and also keep keep your designers focused on deep craft because things are constantly changing and they need to be aware of it. But we can't lose our deep skills. So, how do you navigate those waters? Yeah, I mean, it's really a good question. And I, I don't have a single process for how you do that, like a, a really, you know, like tight answer. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to, th again, thinking and like trying to encourage the younger designers to be thinking about why they're do doing what they're doing. 
um, because there's a lot of, I mean, I, I really value hand skills, whether, you know, whether it's drawing or painting or being able to like sort of execute a sketch. Like I really think that that's the connection between your brain and your ability to, to use images to communicate. Um, so there are a lot of designers in my office who are really good illustrators and can draw. Um, and, and then learn how to do all that on the computer. And of course, applications keep changing. So they're continuing to learn how to update, you know, like there's the latest update of Illustrator or Creative Suite or whatever it is, and they have to continue how to do that, and so do I. So that can, mm -hmm. continues to move forward. But then it's also how do you express yourself in all these other media? It's, it's like, you know, mobile in motion and I mean they're like can you think about how your design might work moving and can you make sure you're thinking about how your design is relevant to the strategy like what's the goal of the thing you're designing and what do you want people to do as a result of seeing it like and is it going to work like is it going to say the people so mm -hmm. I mean we spend a lot of time talking about the, the why and we kind of we have a slogan around the office called question everything which is really just kind That's of the good. mindset I hope that everyone sort of lives within, which is don't accept the brief as is, like if you don't understand something, ask, if it doesn't seem the right answer, ask questions, like if the client doesn't seem like they're asking for something that makes sense to you, try to understand why, so it's, you know, mm -hmm. all of that I think is the thing that, and if you learn skills, it kind of doesn't matter if you're doing them on a Mac or an iPad or by hand or virtually, it's, you know, it's all about the the thinking and understanding how visual imagery relates. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great kind of cultural principle to live by in terms of the questioning, and um, I try that here too. Um, we were going to maybe open it up to some questions soon, but since we have the deck open, Margo, are there, yeah. are there particular places you would like me to review on this? Um, I think, I mean, we're kind of covering all of them. I mean, I have a couple of like embarrassing failure stories that I could um, talk about, and some things that I feel like I keep doing in spite of the fact that I know not to. Um, <laughs> we had a like really scary, scary failure story that happened um, as we were growing. We got um, you know more computers and more um, designers, and we were we got a couple of really big projects all at the same time, and it was kind of the, the first time I'd ever had to really learn how to manage multiple with other people doing it in addition to myself and in addition to have freelancers who were kind of new. So we got a project mm -hmm. from a playing card company called the Upper Deck. They do trading cards and stuff and um, it was a pretty cool project and it involved creating these designs for these cards. And so we had gone through the process of swipe collection like finding imagery and you know doing comps where we were using images we did not own um, and then we were meant to translate those into final art that was executive original art um, but somewhere in the process in the final art some of the original swipe material ended up in the final images and I did not catch it and it got sent to the client as final art in mech and printed and then someone on their staff caught that one of the images was not was actually something we had scanned off the cover of CA magazine, I mean, whatever, like it had to be something that visible, right? Um, so we got this letter from their lawyers and, and I mean, it was like the scariest letter I've ever, ever had in my life, gotten in my life. I thought this is it's the end of my career, we're going to be sued, they're going to take everything I have. <laughs> I was incorporated back then, which is another lesson I learned from this. Um, yeah, it was, that was a really, really scary moment. And so what we ended up having to do was just like profusely apologize. I mean, it, it ended up not being a, a crazy lawsuit in the end because we just profusely apologized and gave them their money back <laughs> and said, right. we're really sorry, what can we do? It was a mistake, you know, we didn't do it on purpose. Um, so that's a good example was, of, uh, it, I was just going to say, that's a good example of, you know, where, where failure is just failure. <laughs> and there's no way to romanticize it. <laughs> There wasn't, I mean, there wasn't a good way out of that one. It was just, yeah, I lost a lot of sleep and that was a scary, scary moment. And it, and I really couldn't even bl blame anyone in the office because it was just my fault. I hadn't set up a good system for where the preliminary work that you're not supposed to use was and where the final art was. We didn't have a good folder structure. We didn't have a good process for how 
systems worked in the office for new designers who were just coming in. So there, I mean, you could say I learned a lot of really valuable lessons from that too. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that was a really uh, scary, <laughs> scary moment. <laughs> it's all behind you now. Uh, yeah. Well, right. there. Um, Unless, unless there's, you know, you wake up to a lawsuit or something, but I, it looks like that's not going to happen. Yeah, um, anything that shows up from a lawyer is a scary thing. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, okay, so um, I'm looking at some hands um, raised here. Uh, Jason, looks like Jason has a question for you. Um, Jason, can we hear you? Mm, no. Okay. The joys of technology. Um, okay. Well, uh, we will still work out these kinks. Apologies to, to those of you that may have questions, but um, I only see one right now from, from Jason at this time, but uh, <clears throat> So I'm, I'm getting some of the questions now that are being written um, to me. So I'm going to ask, this is on behalf of the audience, um, how do you process failure? Uh, when it happens, how do you deal with it is the question. How do you process mm, failure? That's a good question. I guess, well, I guess you know, it depends on what kind of failure it is. Um, I mean, in the case of like the, the legal thing, um, you know, that was scary. So processing it involved like loss of sleep and like agonizing and calling some of my friends who were lawyers <laughs> who, to ask them what they thought I should do. Um, you know, I called my dad. <laughs> really? um, so that process was, and, and that whole, you know, be, be honest and apologize was like his advice and, and really great advice. So. That that was something I learned, and if God forbid it ever happens again, I think I will handle it exactly the same way. Um, the other kinds of failure, like losing a pitch, for instance, or losing a client. I mean, they get processed in really different ways too. I think um, losing a pitch is super frustrating, and honestly, a lot of the time, yeah. things we've lost are you know we always ask reasons that we didn't get it, and sometimes I think we get the truth from a pretty realistic assessment of why we didn't get the business. Um, and sometimes it's things like mm -hmm. you're not small, you're not big enough, you, do, you have, you're too small a studio and we didn't think we would have the experience or this is a global piece of business and you guys only have offices in the United States and so we, it, we went with an agency that has offices in Singapore and London and Geneva or whatever and can't argue against that because you know, I don't know, I do not have offices in those places. So it's, that's frustrating. Because I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, honestly, I feel like the work we is, you know, relevant globally, I and mean, you don't need an office engineer work that works in Europe. Um, but you know, that's how the business is. So you know, we we consider everything that comes up. Like when we get that kind of an answer, I mean, and I and and John Tanner, we spend a lot of time talking about, well, God, should we be trying to grow and do that? You know, what can we do next time to make it clear that we can do that kind of work. Uh, you know, we try to figure out what we can learn to do better based on what we hear. Um, so, I mean, that's mm -hmm. one way of processing it. I, I mean, getting fired do this because, you know, we don't understand their, you know, work or it just isn't a good fit. Um, mm -hmm. Again, another, it's frustrating. It's super hard to not to win, but sometimes projects are just not, like, they're not a good fit. They're, you know, they're, the client isn't a good fit fit kind of emotionally or they don't connect um, or the, the work itself is just not something you have like a path that shows up I think a lot in, in the final result. Great. Um, here's another question from our audience. Um, how how do you teach your designers to recover from and learn from failure? Oh, 
Well, I, so that's interesting. I think sometimes it's harder in when they're starting out sort of part of our process, a creative process in the office. We have a kind of a an unusual way of working where it's a lot of there's a lot of collaboration. Um, so directly head to head competitive in that in Korea some firms are. So um, we tend to start projects with a lot of designers on one, especially with the project. We'll put a lot of designers on it and we'll do first round um, you know, kind of rough creative ideas coming from a lot of different heads, thinking that, and I feel that that's, that really helps us cover a lot of ground and get a lot of really good sort of different ideas that way. But then if, um, as the project goes further in, we usually narrow to a couple of, to a much smaller team. So as a, a, a young designer in this office, you often do pitch work or early work on things that you don't ever get to finish and you don't get to follow it through. And sometimes it's because your work on target and sometimes it's just be because a piece of it was good and sometimes it's because we need to do on something else and the team that's taking that piece of business is going forward is going with it and you got we got to put something you on another project so there are all kinds of reasons that um, designers don't get to kind of be hang on to what they do um, so when I have to pull them off of something that sometimes there's like you, know, you can see the, the frustration or the kind of you know sadness <laughs> And uh, I have to try to talk about it not being personal. And it's, it's also just part of the process. So everyone in the office has gone through that. So I think that's sometimes helpful. Like you can say, it's not just you. This is just how it works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to get, you'll get another chance yeah. as the, you know, the ball comes around again. So. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, here's a good question uh, from the audience. Uh, if failure is so good, why does failure feel so bad? <laughs> well, failure is only good if you can learn from it. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I think that pain is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, we try to say that. Oh, yeah, I can turn lemons into lemonade, right? Like, I can, I can make something good happen out of this. But failure is just a fact of life, right? It's going to happen. You're not going to win all the time. I mean, sometimes it's just plain old failure, and you're not even able to learn from it. So, yeah, it it feels bad because it, you know, it it's not. It didn't. It disappointed you, right? Like it, like for whatever reason, it's like it didn't. The work didn't come out you wanted it to, or the relationship didn't work out the way you wanted it to. It's yeah. I mean, maybe maybe I would to... say if it if it doesn't feel bad, you should probably be worried because because it feels bad because you're competitive and you're ambitious and you want to achieve something, and and so I would take that as a good sign at some level if you needed to reframe it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, I mean maybe they're, they're that if you if you continue if you just have success 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 you don't you aren't really you know learning something and I think that's that might be true like I think I learn things even when things go well <laughs> but they they definitely aren't lessons that stick with you quite as maybe quite as powerfully. Right. Uh, another question here. Um, we have some young designers who are failing at finding work. Um, what advice would you give them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the beginning of the, the seminar, I talked about that process of sitting on sofas. So I um, I feel for you. I know what that. Um, I think the 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 yeah. most important part of of interviewing and having a portfolio is demonstrating your thinking. And I think that's the hardest thing for, for designers coming out. Right now, because you have a portfolio where a lot of the time the projects are, you know, projects you got in class and like everyone else kind of similar. Um, you didn't maybe get an opportunity to really push beyond the parameters of that project and really think about it in real world context. So the thing that I usually look for is work that that have done for themselves or on their own, maybe for a you know a, a private little friend client or something, or even something they've just made up, so that I can get a chance to see how you, you know, uniquely they think. And and it could be it could be anything. I mean, I can I have just portfolios of all kinds from the designers that work here, and some of them were like little web projects, some of them were illustrations, some of them were. Um, paintings like we have the creative director of the New York office Clark Goolsby is actually an artist and that was one of the things that it, about his portfolio because he had his design work and then he had oh yeah and I do this I'm a painter um, 
So to me, that was a really interesting other side of someone. So they're, you know, the fact that they have, um, you know, sort of a, a lively mind and a creative intelligence outside of just their work is really important. So I think trying to, as a young designer, trying to show what you do that's unique and what you can do that's, you know, that's smart and thought is really important. I don't know if that answers like the question. Said. There's always that hard part about even getting <laughs> Well, I like what you said about um, seeing how they think because I think uh, that is the when you're hiring, you're looking at portfolios, and and they can all have merits of aesthetic merits to them, and and but but it really comes down to what their thinking is, what the context was behind that. So, but those are the kind of questions you find yourself having in, in interviews, I, I assume. Uh, I, we spend um, okay, a lot of time, so and when I interview, it also yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, finish your thought. I was just going to ask another question. So, oh. okay. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. We spend a lot of time asking designers why they did what they did. I mean, that's one of the questions I almost always ask. So, why did you do it like this? What does this mean? Why did you know? You know, what did you expect would happen? What would people think about it? I'm always asking those like, who's behind this? Because it's hard to judge can tell from pretty portfolio. I mean, almost every designer we would consider hiring has an amazingly beautiful portfolio. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's got to be about part of that, right? Absolutely. And in storytelling, and I, I wonder if um, that comes up, you know, when you talk about communicating design and presenting design, um, how have you nurtured designers to not fail at that very important aspect of the design process? Well, I, I think, so storytelling is one of those words I don't always know what people mean by it. <laughs> so I think Love that it. the thing I always talk about is how, what's the design meant to do? I mean, I think that there's always a, a function. I mean, as a designer, especially in packaging, there's a function, but almost every piece of design work that we do has a role, has a job to do. I mean, it's not just a painting that can sit on the wall. It has... It's, it's meant to communicate something, sometimes a lot of stuff. Um, so the thing I usually, um, I, I, I mean, I guess where I go when you ask about storytelling is the, the why, what's this for? What's it meant to do and is it well? And so sometimes when you, we present work to clients, I encourage designers to present and that, that's one of the things they get, have to practice, you know, because some designers when they come out of school are kind of not great at talking about their work. So we do a lot of mm -hmm. that kind of coaching, and that's one of the things I really spend a lot of time when, um, you know, they're, you know, encouraging people to talk in front of the client and present. They'll do it mm -hmm. usually when they're younger or beginning. They'll do it with me, and I'll step in and, you know, add or build if it needs to be, you know, built. Because the, the, the thing that usually happens is young designer walks in, presents something, and describes it to the client. It's green, and it has this kind of a logo, mm -hmm. and then it has a photo of this on the front. And... That they can see that. <laughs> they, don't need, right. they don't need you to tell them that. You need to tell them why it's green and it has this kind of yes. <laughs> why is this one and what does this design mean that's different than the next one? You know, what is version one and why is it better than version two? Different from then version two and you know. So those are mm -hmm. those are you know. I don't know if that gets to the storytelling question, but I think that's where yeah. where I go when I think what's well. And then to, to to follow up on that, you know, why do you think? Because there might be some people that run their own studio that wouldn't use designers in that way, or, or younger designers, or, or less experienced designers, maybe. Um, and you you seem to think it's important that they present directly to the client. And and I'd love to know why is that? Like, why do you think it's important for the the client to hear directly from the designer that crafted the solution? Well, I think that it works both ways. I think that. Um, so we've always been a design-driven business, and I think there are a lot of design firms who are maybe more admin-driven. You know, they put their account managers in that interface with the client, and they don't have the creative people present. And I've never heard that <laughs> that idea. I mean, we have really good, smart and account people in this office, and they're brilliant at what they do. But it's a collaboration. It's a team presentation and there's always a creative person in the conversation sometimes 
times more than one. Um, and I think that's because I just feel that important for the clients to hear what the designers thought they were doing and what they think the design represents and what they think the emotional connection is going to be with consumers. And so sometimes there's this, you know, sort of cloak of strategy that has to go around it and you're actually addressing a brief and the client has specific objectives that they want the design to achieve. And we want to talk, make sure that we've addressed all those objectives, but we want to then add on the, the design conversation, right? Because objectives mm -hmm. are really marketing driven usually and they sometimes forget the kind of emotional sort of intuitive part of what design can do. And that's where I think the role mm -hmm. of creative person stepping in and saying, it's this because, you know, this is what these kinds of symbols mean. It's this way because the food is lit this way and it looks, you know, more appetizing or suggests mm -hmm. outdoor light or whatever the, 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 the story is that you're telling about it. And um, I think it's really important for the designers not only to get the practice presenting, but also to hear the feedback directly from the client. So, mm -hmm. that, you know, instead of filtered through, oh, the client said, this here back, you know, through a couple of other people. Um, it's really yeah. important to hear it, I think, firsthand. And then be given the opportunity to ask questions because, as I keep saying, that question process is so, so critical. And, and you have to get comfortable with questioning the client's brief and with not feeling like you can't say anything in meetings and you have to just listen and take notes and just do exactly what they ask. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think part of what we bring those conversations that helps you not fail because I, I the number of times where we didn't ask questions and we walked into a brief that didn't quite make sense I'm just gonna do it I mean it, th that work never is never satisfying it's usually not satisfying to the client and it's not satisfying to us because we don't really understand what we're doing and you can't make a design if you don't understand why so to me it's like whole conversation about the why, what do you really want, what's it supposed to do, what does it mean, all of those how, why, what, who, where, when questions are so, so important to making sure that it works. Yeah, and it makes sense to have the, the designer hear directly from the client in their own words, and because they can be that much more effective in their, in their revisions and, or if any changes need to be made. Um, so that's great. Yeah, um, and we have, you know, I've Someone said they thought that it was a risk having, you know, younger designers in meetings doing presentations because, you know, they might make a mistake or they might not say the right thing, but we haven't actually had that experience. I mean, I think most of our clients are pretty, they understand that that's the, you know, person on staff who's working on that project, and so they seem to be happy to have that engagement and that process and to have that feedback. Um, so it's been a pretty good experience for us rather than, I mean, I, I can't, every once in a while we'll get, a, you know, a feedback call from a client and they'll say, you know, that was a little, we were a little worried about that, that didn't the way we wanted it to go, but that hasn't happened much and it's almost always, again, been a kind of good learning experience for us because we it, I always learn something from that. I'm like, oh, okay, that's how you want it. That's why you, you ask that question. I get it. So. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like maybe the last question. Um, uh, are you weary of hiring freelance designers without agency or studio experience? I presume someone who comes from an in-house design situation or... Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, designers without experience, that probably isn't good. <laughs> uh, I mean, it depends on... It, Agency or studio experience, meaning they've never, they're right out of school, maybe? I don't, I'm not sure about I think, the, the yeah. point of the question. But, I, uh, I would interpret it, I would interpret it as someone who probably hasn't worked on a client services capacity. Maybe they've been either in-house uh, somewhere. I'm a designer at Mattel and I do product design, um, but I haven't been in a, in a client relationship agency model. Yeah, I mean, in general, I'm not really that leery about hiring people freelance because freelance is a sort of safe relationship, in my opinion. Um, and if I can, if I'm considering hiring somebody, if I can freelance with them first, I would much prefer it um, because I get a chance to work with that person and see what they can do. Um, so for me, I mean, getting uh, we our office is really it moves really fast. Things go a mile a minute, and we really need people who know what they're doing and. You know, we don't have a lot of time to, you know, 
train someone who comes in from another from somewhere with absolutely no experience but coming in out of school we do internships and so we have that kind of program set up and um, and as I said freelance is, is a really great kind of win-win situation for us because we get a chance to try them and they get a try chance to try us and that way we know if, if it's working then it's it can be an ongoing freelance relationship or it could be a full-time hire yeah that's great well, it looks like we're, we're out of time. I really want to thank you for taking your time out of your busy day to, to talk to us here. And um, thank you to everyone else who, who took the time out of their day to, to tune in today. Yeah, thank um, you. We I'm did, sorry we I keep this. hearing your question. <laughs> yeah, we will work Thanks, out the kinks as we go along. And, and it was great talking yeah. to you, Margo. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you very much. It was, thanks for inviting me in. <laughs> Take care. Okay.